Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to welcome all of you to NEMO's webinar today, uh, Rethinking Museum Accessibility Strategies. And I'm very excited to welcome our today's facilitator, Maria Chiara Chaccheri, Chaccheri. Chakeri, a museum consultant and researcher based in Turin in Italy. And um, for today's topic, I have to say Nemo was looking into options to make the webinar uh, more accessible uh, to deaf people and people who are hard of hearing. And unfortunately, this platform is off offering a very poor tool. So for now, what we can do is um, that later on when we upload the recording to YouTube, uh, there are uh, there's the subtitle function that can be used, but we know that we also need to improve um, our work in regard to accessibility. My name is Mira. I'm from the NEMO office, uh, NEMO, the network for museums in Europe. Uh, and our one of our main activities is to provide free trainings for our members, such as this webinar, but we also offer longer uh, trainings and workshops uh, online or on site. Uh, we also have um, a mentoring program for museum educators and much more. So please check out our website um, or our newsletter. And uh, before I hand over to Chiara, Maria Chiara, I want you, the participants, to know that at the end of the session, after 45 minutes approximately, we will have a Q&A session uh, with Chiara. So you have the opportunity to ask questions and we do that through the uh, chat function and I will moderate it in the end. Um, yeah, so now I'm really excited to hear more about this extremely relevant topic of museum ac accessibility. Maria Chiara, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Mira, and thank you, everyone. Um, I can recognize a, a, a few friends around there. So just a couple of words about me. I work as a researcher, a consultant and facilitator, um, mostly in Italy. And um, for me, uh, when we talk about accessibility, motivation is essential. And that's why in um, um, the last few years, I developed a project trying to tell about these topics in a kind of engaging way, which means through illustrations. Um, while a couple of years ago, I wrote a book for American Alliance of Museum, and this, the dimension engagement and METSUR are probably the pillars or of the discipline we are going to talk about. Today, I tried to answer a few questions. So first of all, what does it mean? What is accessibility today? And uh, which barriers and stereotypes we need to break down in museums and not only? Totally. My question, my big question is, how can we somehow promote change in cultura, cultural organization um, through this approach? And how maybe we can also impact on society at large? Uh, and then a big question is, which is where to start from? And uh, I close today presentation with a few insights from, well, I would say a fresh perspective, which means uh, a few stuff I learned in the last few years. Um, but let, let's start from the very beginning, which means accessibility is about the relationship with, between people and the environments. And um, I mean, you can access or not a place, you can use a pen uh, or you can't, uh, you can feel included in a guided tour in a museum or recognize yourself in a place, also depending on accessibility. And um, well, think to a couple of elderly, uh, for them, um, an accessible park will have frequencies or efficient public transportation to get there, um, places and service for sociability, for meet other people, friends. A person using a wheelchair, first of all, will need to feel independent. And that's why he will need 
knowing in advance about uh, facilities and accessible services. A family which has just moved from another country, um, just we need as any one of us to feel comfortable and uh, to, to find places where uh, they can understand the language, the context, and find, of course, facilities for a family, which are quite specific. And um, in a few words, accessibility is the ability to design for different needs. And um, it takes place also, always, within uh, uh, an environment, within a surrounding, because uh, different organizations should collaborate for offering citizenship opportunity. And, and I'm not just talking about cultural organizations, uh, however, it will be our focus, but all what is around, because again, uh, it's not just being in the museum. Many times is going there and going there means pushing a stroller through the city, uh, being blind and decided to um, uh, start looking for information through the website or your sister uh, is victim of uh, harassment because of her sexual orientation and uh, your son is whatever. I mean, you need to find an environment which is accessible and also just think of transportation, again, hospitals, uh, school, university, how many um, kind of phrases we can find to accessibility. Um, the relation between organization and environment is very open, it's totally fluid in the sense that culturalizations and museums first absorb from the environment the social and cultural awareness, which means also stereotypes and prejudice, which is a huge topic. And for instance, when we talk about disability, it often makes the difference, the kind of model uh, we have. If disability uh, is intended as an illness, for instance, because in that country, in that society, uh, we have that perception museums as well propo will propose activity with that idea in mind. But something else which is as well as important is that cultural organization can give back to the environment impacts and perceptions about people. But, but we'll see and we'll talk more about this. Um, so access is the ability to design for different needs, a place, a service, a product, and uh, to overcome any mismatch between the person and the environment. Uh, and of course, we observing this relation from the perspective of the environment, however, sometimes also from the person and the visitor. Uh, we think to mismatches related to disability only for the most of the occasion talking about accessibility in most of countries, uh, actually even in the United States um, or, or Italy. Uh, and this is a huge part of this discipline, definitely. But at the same time, uh, it's probably even much more, more complex in the sense that each of us is a universe and uh, different characteristics coexist in us and changes over time. Just think to cultural background, the income you get, your origin, the cultural capital, the studies you've done, the age, the language, gender issues, disability again. And uh, these elements in us change maybe over time. And each of them can be object of a mismatch and therefore of a discrimination. And that's the point. Well, um, something interesting more that we know is that several issues together can also cause a mismatch, which even deeper. And that's about intersectionality, which is currently an uh, um, issue we're discussing a lot. Um, there are also some contingent situations in which mismatch also occurs. For instance, 
uh, if you visit a museum alone or not, if you're interested or your lack of motivation, if you have free time available. Um, well, think uh, to the first example of yourself visiting a place with a two years old or alone. Well, it makes a lot of the difference. And the facilities you need in the first case are totally different from the second one. So what we've seen up to now is that access deals with everyday needs. And um, if you look at this family, we, we can assume uh, so many information, but uh, probably this young guy just loves to run everywhere. What we know for sure, however, is that this family, my neighbors, in 50 years, 50 years later, will have many and many more needs. Uh, access so is definitely essential for any of us and for our societies. If we bring this topic and um, move it to the museum, well, it takes even a, a stronger symbolic value because the issue is that um, we're kind of excluding a lot of people uh, because of the characteristics the ones we saw previously. And uh, if we are excluding someone, it also means that we are deciding what is culture and uh, for whom is for. And um, museums are so relevant because in this place, we preserve what we believe is precious. We preserve our uh, values, but uh, it also, deals uh, with um, such as justice and is connected to really big questions. So uh, who counts as human? What is right? And again, who is responsible? A um, lot of the issues we are talking about are kind of cultural because uh, our society is always changing and, and, and is changing uh, a lot. And um, museums should change as well because the visitors, the people of two centuries ago are not anymore the same today. And uh, what is interesting is that um, accessibility can drive this change. For instance, we in regards to huge transformations we are observing in well, societies, just think of aging population again, cognitive impact of digital, migration, identity issues. So let's try to, to, to give kind of definition. Uh, museum accessibility is both a method and a process, and we'll see, of removing barriers that limit people, people's participation in museums. And people are those who visit the museum, of course, but also those who work there. Well, just a few giveaways. I already talked a lot. So accessibility is about people and the environments. Each person is a universe, but our characteristics and needs can change over time. And accessibility responds to changes in society and people's needs. So what about barriers? we read in the definition. When we talk about barriers in museums, we refer to both, to museum staff and to museum audience. Museum staff, I suppose that most of you following this presentation comes from the cultural field, but, and, and you know how it can be hard to access um, this world because people, can find barriers uh, related to disability, gender, racial, such economical issues. Just think how long it was to arrive here, to which means to do university, to maintain somehow or get help for doing years of internship. And I mean, it's not that easy to be part of this world. And um, diversity is a topic. When someone reached to work within a cultural field, maybe can find barriers in working culture because of it, 
diversity, any kind of. And, um, well, most often, however, we know that people um, dealing with this subject is kind of homogeneous workforce, uh, which more or less generates homogeneous proposal, which as well can be an obstacle for many. When the staff, this more general, think of removing barriers, they often refer to different actions aimed at reaching especially vulnerable minorities. And this is what happens generally. And um, accessibility is limited in terms of process, responsibilities, importance. Of course, it's not like everywhere there are museums which are doing amazing work. But more often, accessibility is just just little work within even huge organization. And uh, this happens also because it's often subject to st of stereotypes and misunderstandings, like uh, it's only for few people, it deals with special needs, it is responsibility of people who work in education or just in architecture or um, the front line. It is considered expensive, it rarely considers usability, denies aesthetics, uh, it is considered restrictive and it doesn't deal with organization, internal processes, strategies. So um, actually this kind of access exists, but uh, I don't think it doesn't work very well. And again, we, we need to consider other uh, approaches. Um, stereotypes, however, are not just about the discipline, but are often about the audience itself. And um, this uh, limits uh, a lot our ability to plan, because if we, uh, for instance, we tend to consider um, people with disability just having low income, which is an issue because the um, people with disabilities, because of the barriers in societies, have the highest rate of find the meet the highest rate of unemployment. But at the same time, we have to be um, be careful with a lot of assumptions we do with teens, we're elderly, with so uh, this is something. And um, if we move on the audience side, we know that some people are the most discriminated. And we know from literature and from uh, experiences, and these people are not oh, vulnerable. They are elderly, they have low education, maybe low income, they can be victims of racism, it's LGBTQ plus community, people with disabilities, but also single parents, people living in remote areas, and families with young children. For them, barriers, for us, are often being, being able to access and participate, recognize themselves, having an engaging, relaxing experience, or even spending time with someone. These are quite common. Um, not having the opportunity to spend time with someone, sorry. Um, obstacles can be of different types. We've seen the barriers to work in the field, but also barriers can be absolute. They can have to do with a museum which is closed. It's, of course, a barrier. We can see that obstacles most of times, apart from the absolute ones, are relative, and they change according to people and situation. Um, we have discriminatory barriers, but not impossible. For instance, those related to uh, representation. I don't feel represented um, in the museum, but of course I can go. Or otherwise, those that limit the quality of experience. I'm very interested in that museum, but uh, it's really hard to understand. So um, the quality can be lower. And then we had those kind of impossible. If in a place um, in which the sight is the only sense allowed, a blind people can find, um, can access actually any content. 
So some impossible obstacles are difficult to narrow, and we used to refer to uh, motor barriers, visual barriers mostly, but also income, time constraints, uh, distance from the offer or lack of motivation are can be um, very relevant topics. Uh, however, toward lack of motivation, again, we need to be careful because it's not always related to cultural capital. Uh, it's just that sometimes people prefer to do something else and um, that choice also need to be respected. Um, we can't forget in all this uh, discourse that accessibility was born in the 70s thanks to the activities movement of people with disabilities and the protests and the manifestation. And, uh, um, and this process is still running because today there are Hmong who encounter the most hard barriers to overcome. And that's... Uh, um, definitely a big part but uh, at the same time social cultural barriers are not easy to be removed and uh, um, there's kind of even a lack of research um, what we know however from some studies is that uh, well aquariums are for instance perceive a, a kind of more comfortable places um, for some people where people feel less inadequate and this is kind of suggestions for museums again to rethink about themselves. Barriers are many, they are dynamic, related to information, participation, representation, digital, cognitive in, in the broadest sense and many many others. It is important to experience that to, rem to remember that most of time the experience is allowed, but we can see recognize different forms of discrimination. Um, <clears throat> we tend to think that barriers are just in the exhibition design or maybe in the communication or the frontline stuff attitude, but actually they are everywhere. Uh, in the curatorship ship choice, in communication, in the events, in the website, anywhere, and um, and more, because the the most impactful and most difficult to overcome are actually invisible, and uh, we could define them as indirect. Deals with uh, working processes, organization, strategy, mission, policies. And it deals with um, stereotypes, they require training to all the employees and define long term strategy. Um, it's the year part of a more recent uh, uh, discourse and discussion about accessibility. Um, so what we what I said up to now that uh, barriers are related to both audience and staff. There are many stereotypes that limit development. Uh, there are direct and uh, indirect barriers, and indirect barriers are invisible and the hardest to remove. So we have seen some some issues, but but what we also said that access is a method, but also is a process. So what does it mean? Where to start to um, break down? all these barriers. First of all, despite of anything, you should involve your the leadership, the final responsible for accessibility, train the whole staff and the final budget. This is uh, um, an essential premise for success. And then probably a strategy there thousands of course but one is to select one hour one area just start from something and we could just decide to start from make our events more accessible and then we will need to first of all understand the context well define the aims train the staff with that focus analyze the environment and map the barriers and that's essential uh, involve the stakeholders 
brainstorm solution and then define policy, update our strategic plan, and so on. This process is never-ending process and involved the, the, the organization more generally. When we talk about solution, well, actually, as as humans probably, uh, we, we tend to just go deeply to solution, but analysis is probably is sometimes uh, the, the, as, have the same importance. When we talk about solution in accessibility, we refer to thousands of options. And solutions are really endless with different level of engagement and quality and innovation are often in the design. Um, I, I can tell you which are the most popular. For instance, we have frontline training, accessibility tools, educational proposal, accessible routes. And uh, on another level of awareness, we can see all staff training, barriers audit, work on communication, solution for the autonomous visit, co-design, events. What we are interested here to say is that the highest level of awareness, again, it deals with uh, invisible barriers. And it requires, of course, probably years of work to be well um, made. In any case, in any case, accessibility works when it involves the whole institution. Um, okay, again, but what solution among infinite possibilities? It's it the big question. And uh, a strategy is to define priority from easiness and urgency. Um, we need to set criteria for choices where to start from. And this matrix, which is called as Eisenhower matrix, give us, uh, um, suggest us a way to choose, which means to define some criteria for, um, for define what is easy, what is hard, what is urgent and not urgent. And what is easy is low budget, require a few, few person, is easy to do, and urgent is kind of, that's impossible barrier we saw earlier. earlier. What does it mean? We're planning uh, about how to make our events accessible. We have mapped all the barriers. And uh, well, something easy is the feeder for the guys or changing table. It's something urgent. We, if we don't have anything about this, any facilities, live captions, and, um, well, we need to put um, on the matrix different ideas. Caterpillar wheelchair, well, it's not urgent and it's even expensive. Let's put in in this area. So uh, what is interesting about this tool is that give us some suggestion for defining priority. What to do first is an urgent. What to do second is still easy. What is urgent and hard, which is probably our core, what we need to focus really. And then, well, sorry, there's not enough time for this stuff because we are, usually have so many things to do, but this is not valid for all the solution, but can give you uh, really an, an help. So, um, we need to work on access step by step, however, having a vision and a strategy. And for start, we can just define one area, map its barriers, define priority for the solution, and do what we can as best as we can. So, um, this, um, this, uh, um, highlights make sense uh, uh, together with uh, um, different approaches um, and uh, which means that uh, accessibility makes sense uh, only when it promotes uh, autonomy 
and um, enable choices and uh, empower people. This is a project uh, which won a lot of awards in the United States. Uh, it's called Out Loud, and uh, it's a um, huge project which so involved different departments and a lot of uh, uh, stakeholder um, co-design. And this proposal allows allow blind and not blind people to visit this uh, um, the Andy uh, Warhol Museum, um, thanks to uh, some digital solution and uh, short uh, um, audios. And um, the narratives are, comes from different perspectives. There's the voice of the director, of the curator, but as well as the uh, person working at the um, welcoming area or uh, the um, educator and the visitor itself. So um, different perspectives, short audios, and um, um, I, I don't know how to say, but the headphones can be shared with a person and all these characteristics came from research. However, what is interesting here is that that push toward autonomy, which is something we can't always have dealing with accessibility, but should be our most ambitious um, one of our most ambitious um, uh, vision, I would say. Um, and to promote autonomy means always to refer to the visitor journey and to put ourselves in the shoes of someone else um, and try to envision how these experience and the direct barriers can impact on the experience of different people. Um, some design tools can help in this way. For instance, personas can help. Um, and um, if we forget to consider this process, even in the space through uh, highlights, um, we risk to not understand exactly what's happening. For instance, well, in this illustration, there is a guy with a, there is a blind person with his guide dog uh, who said, they told me they added some braille labels and I hope they are also mid-centered because of course, if we haven't thought exactly at the visitor experience, how this person we can 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 find them. Of course, we are assuming you go with someone else, a friend, or a family member, a carer. But uh, can you imagine the situation to go together toward the braille label and then say, "Okay, this is the braille. Please read." So um, we have to be uh, consistent and make complex evaluation. Mm, supporting autonomy anytime we can, anytime we can, means also knowing that accessibility somehow impacts on behavior. And um, a, a wonderful and inspiring reading is about Richard Thaler and Cass Sustain, and it's called Nudge. Thaler won the, the, the prize for the Nobel Prize for Economy a few years ago. And this book uh, is about nudging and nudging. Nudge is a gentle pushing. You're gently pushing someone to do something that can be helpful for them, but without being manipulative. So you are kind of facilitating. And um, an example from the National Gallery is uh, an example about accessibility as well as nudging. They decided to change the titles of their gallery rooms, which were in the past um, uh, entitled to the centuries, um, you know, 19th century, 18th centuries. They made visitor research and they discovered that people inside this museum just were looking for, for the artists. I, I, I go to the National Gallery because I want to see the Van Gogh, the Vermeer. And so they decided to put that information in the orientation and 
um, they facilitated the orientation, they facilitated the decision-making process of people, and that's definitely accessibility. Mm. Actually, access gives priority to our cognitive needs before the anything else. Um, we know a lot about our brain functioning and about our biases um, and the behavior of people in museums. Uh, is it, I found very interesting to observe um, and reading research on how uh, readability impacts on understandability. We, we can't read in anything too much complex, uh, huge um, essay or uh, I don't know what from our uh, smartphone. And that's something, but at the same time, you know, when we read in a book, what well, the index is the key for, for, for surviving again, to get oriented and is the same for a map of the museum. In this case is also a sensory map, but, um, is again the same process from macro to micro that um, a person who is blind exploring a tactile surface uh, use, which means first of all we say and um, we help exploring that surface uh, understanding which is the big subject and then go into details. It's our brains that work this way despite of seeing or not. Um, multisensory elements increase time spent and reinforces memory of experience. Multisensory um, stimulus are essential in accessibility as well as uh, is uh, conceiving experiences which are multi-channel experiences. And uh, uh, again, this is a reminder on how uh, this subject is important for any one of us. Um, universal design or inclusive design? Well, I, I would say both, and it's, it's not just me. This is a um, kind of misunderstanding because universal design is essential. Anytime we can, we have to do things for how many as people as possible. Think of a label would be better to have it easy to read, well contrasted, right size of the font, relevant context, downloadable from the website, and so on. Uh, you, you can find online a thousand of good checklists, um, but um, a museum label for uh, its own um, um, way of being can be accessible for all. And, also, we, we know that one side doesn't fit for all. That, that's, that's kind of a rule. And that's why inclusive design is also a good strategy, which allows to design different solutions for different people. And this is um, um, and right at the same. Um, we are going toward the end. Uh, um, it considers perception accessibility that it generate uh, access. We say it, it's about normal needs. It, it, it's, I think it's, we also need to change uh, our perception of what is normal and what is special because otherwise we risk to exasperate the division, the, 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 uh, the, the um, psych what social psychology define in group and out group, they are those who need to be helped and we are those who help. And this is kind of risky and dangerous, not just within the museum, but as an impact for the society. Um, if we look at needs and not just the labels, well, um, we can see a person with one arm, with a broken arm, and a new parent. Uh, all the three have the same needs. But if you think, we tend to say poor guy or even what a hero just to the first person. And this impact um, can impact negatively uh, either on our programs is a big bias. Aesthetic matters a lot in accessibility, also to overcome stereotypes. And the story we share also matters. This is um, historical, apparently traditional museum in Venice who decided to uh, redesign 
can re rewrite their museum labels uh, with the focus on uh, gender issues um, and a lot of attention and historical research. The Welcome Collection in London is the finance described as one of the most accessible museums in the world. Uh, and this also because it is definitely a multi channel and um, is not just a route uh, uh, spontaneously uh, for everyone and then just a few solutions for special needs here and there. Everything is accessible, and that's the idea, and that's inclusion, and that's make uh, um, in this way we intend culture valuable for everyone. Mm. And um, well, the last access can be creative all around and low cost, and this is again about our to break down stereotypes. Um, there is a research from two researchers, uh, Jordan and Maisel, who said that um, if we think to accessibility just as a normative, uh, as a normative, uh, normative approach, uh, we tend to vehiculate the perception that is just for specialists. And so our uh, colleagues and the institutional, uh, well, uh, won't feel so engaged. Why, if we start thinking as access, as a creative process in which everyone can be involved, well, it comes to, it ends up being kind of way of thinking. And in this um, illustration be, be, made by Carol um, uh, which is a, a French illustrator we, we, we involved with other colleagues for this um, graphic project, well, uh, we collected ideas how to make accessibility through local solution. Well, provide portable chairs, offer baby marsupium, create priority entries, define protocols for welcoming people. Well, so many ideas, but I mean, we can do a lot with uh, also few economical resources. Just think from the British Museum, but we have thousands of examples like this. They wrote 12 steps at the entrance. It's totally inexpensive to write this into add this information on your website, but uh, well, it can be relevant for many. Or uh, again, MACBA in Barcelona decided to make access as a topic of research, but research in the sense uh, of content. And so they decided to offer an online tour exhibition on some museums, works of art that reflect on visuality. And what does it mean for us give uh, to sites this prominence? Uh, so sometimes it's like the, I mean, when uh, uh, we, the creative opportunity is something that we are, kind of censoring also in our organization. We, we, we feel like we're not allowed to experiment. And again, access in this way, in this case, um, in this image, we see Carmen Papali as a performing blind artist, um, Canadian, uh, who makes such a joyful and, uh, and, and funny performance, which is also something which means seeing access such a positive opportunity for all of us to, I mean, uh, make more research, uh, questioning ourselves and our institution. Um, so the hope is that access could turn on and, and change in the future in something else where all the staff is involved, where there is... Uh, long long way vision you, you know and to 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 contribute little or big but also not just inside but also outside and well make feel people part of something bigger so i'm i finished i'm very
punctual also. So here are just a few suggestions for reading for anyone who is interested. I finished. Thank you very much. Back on stage. Oh. Can you hear me? Here I am. <laughs> ah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, but I yeah. don't know how to. Should I make close? Yes. No, no, you do. Oh, no. oh sorry. No, could just uh, well, I... Yeah, perfect. <laughs> so we are back. Yeah, thank you very much, Maria Chiara, for this input. I mean, it's a super wide topic as we all know and we i realized again today so i thank you very much for this uh, i know we could dive uh, um, deeper much more into this topic as we still it's a one hour webinar so i'm very happy uh, that we got this input from you i think one of the crucial sentences um, um, we heard today is that uh, access and accessibility is essential for all of us it's not them and us and then also it's super helpful to have uh, this breakdown of, you know, step by step where to start because it's so wide, as I said, it's, you know, it's ongoing. <laughs> um, so we have a few more minutes uh, for some uh, questions, but also I wanted to tell you, uh, because people were asking already, so um, the session um, is being recorded and it will be on uh, the Nemo YouTube channel within the next weeks. Also, this uh, great presentation from Maria Chiara will be um, shared. And um, at the end uh, um, of this session, you will also see Maria Chiara's email address and can always get in touch with her if you have further questions, input, um, whatsoever. So, um, Let's see, we had um, questions. One was um, if we had to prioritize in terms of economic um, resources, first make our facility or museum physically accessible, even if we can't invest much in external support elements. Is that right? Was one question. Uh, Mira, sorry, may I ask you? I, I can't see the chat. Can you? The chat? Uh, you Help can me. See it. Is it? No. Um, I can I can read it for you, but um, okay, okay. If um, did you hear what? So so this was one yeah. of the one questions. Um, you know, if it's um, if you have to prioritize uh, in terms of economic resources, um, where to start? Sorry, no, I also. Um, first, make the museum physically accessible. Is that what you would um, would suggest, even if they can't invest much in external support elements? Yeah, well, there are also uh, um, um, big issues about um, laws and normative, which is mm -hmm. probably the basics. So, um, yes, that's a point. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, a big point. That's true. Yeah. Um, there is one question about the digital transformation solutions, um, if they are urgent for accessibility projects and museums. Um, so uh, how to consider digital tools into museum accessibility? Um, uh, digital tools are definitely uh, relevant in accessibility, especially for people with sensory disability, made the difference in the last few years, and that innovation is amazing. Um, I just think that digital is any other tools. The difference is made by design. If it's well designed, it can be um can be useful uh, again depending on the, the the aims we have but uh, i mean uh, i think like we, we we can't um adopt any moral judge in anything just be open and observe and observe is it impactful or or not yeah so um yeah if you still have a question please ask maria clara uh, there is one more. Um, okay. Sorry. Oh, this is not a question. Okay. Um, 
I would say please all get in touch with Maria Chiara if you have further questions. I thank you very much. I'm always amazed about um, you know, how many people attend those webinars from all over the world, actually. Um, they can they listen to you this one hour. Thank you very much for this input. And um, yeah, thank you. See thank you. you.